My name is Deacon Ewa from the San Diego Chronicle. Tonight I'm going to have a conversation with four individuals who are each one my friend, yet are strangers to each other. We're going to talk about Soccer City as an initiative and specifically as it affects all of these different individuals from their sort of unique background. What we are trying to do is kind of come to consensus with regards to what exactly we want to see from this city, from this initiative, and from our community. The one takeaway I would want each one of you to have who watches this video is to understand that San Diego means something a little bit different for each of us. And that's not a bad thing. Celebrate diversity. Enjoy your community. Craft your community with conversation. Hi guys, cheers. 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 Right. Beers and conversations. Beers and conversations. Actually, this is, this right here tonight, this evening, is the first ever edition of what I'm calling crafting community with conversation. There's beers and By the Chronicle. Oh, by the Chronicle. Yes. Presented by the San Diego Chronicle. Yes. Um, no, this is, this is um, in my opinion, the first of what I hope to be many different iterations of this same type of environment, right? Me, DK Newell, my friends, whoever happened to be here tonight, I'm joined by Jason Gerlach, Madison Pryor, Nick Stone, and of course, Nicholas McCann. But what we're here today to talk about is Soccer City and how I sort of came alongside having covered this entire story from a soccer perspective and having somehow found myself at city council meetings in the city here of San Diego and somehow <laughs> finding myself embroiled in arguments on Twitter with people who I've never heard of and still don't think actually exist. <laughs> but I think when you take a step back from the internet, when you take a step back from social media, and you actually sit belly to belly with people, you find out so much more about what everyone's about. So what I would like to say is, first of all, thank you all for coming here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Soccer City. You know, here we are in the city of San Diego, California. Uh, Nick, you're the managing partner and what, project manager at Soccer manager. City. So as part of my job, I have the luxury of getting to lead this effort to try and create Major League Soccer in the city of San Diego. And at the same time, to create a park and to do something that I think will truly revolutionize the corner of Mission Valley. Can you give us just a general overview of what this entire thing is? It started with an idea that uh, the town was likely to lose the Chargers. And we're going to get a life again. Like, what are the keys to the assets here? What gets people excited about being in the community? And, you know, Sports have their pros and their cons, but like one of the things they do an incredibly good job of, particularly when you're doing well, is find a community together. So, what's Soccer City? It's a, it's a goal um, and an idea to create a new sports franchise in the city of San Diego that is the fastest growing sport in these major sports in America today. And particularly for the next generation, you know, the generation that slightly, I'm now slightly too old for. Um, is the second most popular and really rapidly growing. And like, let's use that as an anchor to build this thing around that people find compelling from the ages of 20 to 60, 365 days a year, not six. Yeah. And we started this from a very apolitical perspective, probably not deeply in hindsight, if, if I had to do it all over again, thinking we're going to figure out how to make this work without a bunch of political work that we think we need to have something that works for the university. We think we have City and welcome to San Diego, that didn't happen. Um, but we committed from the beginning to be transparent. And so, like, please, part of why I'm here is to learn people from people who have real ideas and, and emotions about it. What is underpinning your questions and how do we answer those? You have to be transparent about providing answers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you mentioned you know, here in San Diego where things happen slash don't happen. And I kind of want to kick it over to Nick McCann, who's, I think, been here the longest. Uh, yeah, you know. I've been in San Diego for 37 years. I'd like to let people know about uh, my website, The Kept Faith, and podcast. It's available on iTunes. <laughs> what is, what was, I mean, just how do you, how do you define San Diego yourself as a native? Um, it's a city, it's an impact city. I think everybody wants to move here. I think there's a lot of transplants. And that's always affected the, the sports scene. I think that's, that's been the hardest thing for the baseball team. And I think that the football team at the end was that, there were so many people living here from other markets that would come and root for the other team. And it was really, it was depressing for yeah. a long time. And you know, when, when the Chargers left, I, I got excited about Soccer City because honestly it, was, it, 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 it felt like it could be a 
F you to Dean. It's badass. Like that's what I, I thought we could build something, just get it done, and it would somehow hurt him. I don't know. Was that, and that was part of your motivation? Yeah, yeah. I was, I, well, let's just do it. I was talking to our friend Darren Smith, Mighty 1090. He came on our show and he was just, he was talking about it. Like, why don't we just come together and do this? But it, of course, in San Diego, it doesn't really happen. Everybody takes their own sides and it's not, you know, the hoteliers come involved and stuff like that. But yeah. it, it can get pretty frustrating. And I remember on our show that we, that we, that we do every couple every week. Like there was so much cynicism about it. Like about soccer oh, city. nothing. Well, just nothing will ever get done in San Diego. And that was that was hard to feel after losing the Chargers. I remember maybe the immediacy of that was difficult. Yeah. But. Is that something that you've become familiar with, Nick? All the different factions and infighting and Since naysayers. Yeah. 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 So we heard all of that at the beginning. We were like, ah, oh, that's not me. <laughs> This is Maybe we're not asking not. for any money, and we're we're you know contributing a bunch of value in a park. And we're doing all these things that we think people want. We sort of thought we would get through that, and it turns out that was hopelessly naive. Um, so we're sort of more acclimated to the ways we're going to work. Yeah, look, look, what I really hope we get out of this is like a fully informed letter to get to the side. This is my asset. I own this piece of land today. I'm a taxpayer in city of San Diego. It's my asset. And I want to put my stamp on what happens there. And if we get that, and people really know what they're choosing between, and we lose, well, okay. Like I, we had a fair vote. But it's got to be a fair vote. Mm -hmm. So let's have a fair vote. Let's have people be informed. And the more of this that we can do to help that discussion happen, win or lose, I'll be okay. We'll be okay. When, when you talk about you know what people are choosing between, obviously on one hand, there is a soccer state proposal, which is kind of what we're here to discuss tonight. But on the other hand, there's this SDSU West initiative. And I know a few of us have different ties to SDSU in one shape or another. I'd like to maybe call on Madison here. Right. And just to kind of get your understanding of Cyber City compared to, say, SDSU West. Yeah. Even though tennis is my favorite sport, soccer is a close second. I played it longer than tennis. And so I couldn't raise a family in a community that didn't incubate a soccer community. I don't have a position on soccer city. That being said, uh, I knew there was controversy. I knew that something was happening, but when I saw the tables outside of the places that I would go to, um, I didn't know what to believe because I didn't trust any of the people tabling. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I would see things on the news saying that there's controversy, not that I trust the news either. So, um, you know, I guess I just didn't know what resources were going to actually give me information about what was happening. This was before the San Diego Chronicle launched, right? Yeah. Because now you know that the Chronicle Now I know. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, but so. at the time, yeah, this was this was about a year ago. Um, so at the time, I didn't even know where to go to find out more about the issue. Um, and it wasn't, if, if there was a spot, it wasn't convenient to find. Okay. So that's where I'm coming from. In terms of like understanding sort of what was still, happening. Yeah, trying to figure it out still, you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because I feel like I'm going to get some insight Easy today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jason, girl. Yes, how are you today? I'm great. Yeah. Thanks for having me, DK. Thanks for Good coming. to be here. My full time job is as the managing partner and CEO of Sunrise Capital Partners. We're a 38 year old asset management firm in North County, San Diego, and Carlsbad. I'm also a full-time dad of two, um, and I'm a part owner of the Orange County Soccer Club uh, U21 NPL team. Uh, I want to get your sense for, because obviously Nick opened up and he spoke a lot about the idea of soccer. You know, I know that you mentioned that you have a son who's been playing over 10 years now. And I know that what, two and a half, almost three years ago, when the North County Battalion became a thing, you jumped on very early, not just as a supporter or even as a sponsor, but you bought in to that franchise. Correct. You know, so tell me a little bit more about how you look at soccer, not just from the field perspective and the playing, but also from the business side. Well, for me, it's not just a soccer thing, it's a sports thing. I mean, touching back on some of the things some of the other folks here have said, I mean, sports binds communities together. It's a common thread. And um, for some reason, San Diego uh, seems to have lost its way with some of the sports franchises here. It's baffling to me that there's no longer NFL football in San Diego. Yeah. Just baffling. A team with that history, that tradition, those uniforms, the Dan Fouts and Junior Seau 
and you know playing in Super Bowls, yet that's gone. So when I met Jason Barbato and had the opportunity to get involved in, in his project, which was North County Battalion, which was just a, a small minor league soccer um, operation in uh, the Carlsbad, Encinitas, kind of you know, North County area, I jumped at it because I thought, wouldn't that be great if I could bring my kids and my neighbors and, and meet my friends and go to a game nearby and, and talk about what was going on and have a beer and talk about the game. And, and it's exactly how it unfolded. It created a really great little community very quickly. Um, you know, it wasn't massive. It wasn't on the scale of the Chargers and the Padres, but there was a real there there. And it, it meant a lot to people. You know, people would write us notes saying, thank you so much for being behind this team. I've loved coming to games. Or, you know, boy, that playoff game was a thrill. I've never been more excited about a soccer game ever. I mean, that, you know, even now I'm getting tingles in my back. It's, there's just, there's nothing like a sporting event to kind of bring people together, regardless of their political background, their religious background, their socioeconomic status. Everyone can relate. Everyone can talk baseball. Everyone can talk football. Everyone can talk soccer. So it was, it was a no-brainer to get involved, and uh, it's been very rewarding. The downside of it is, you know, it's a business, and uh, to, to, to play, you gotta, you gotta pay, and uh, you're gonna lose some money doing it. And so people need to respect that when people step up and are willing to write big checks to create something that'll be a community asset, in your case, on a community asset, you know, you gotta step back and maybe say, okay, is this something where we wanna play petty politics or is this something where maybe we wanna rally and say, boy, this is a decent deal. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. That's the thing that's baffling to me. You know, how you can take something that's so positive and turn it into what appeals, appears to be some kind of political stalemate. I've only been in San Diego 11 years, so I'm probably not as qualified to comment <laughs> as others, but I do not get it. I do not get the, the controversy. Um, and I hope it can get resolved because I think a great professional soccer team that everyone can get behind in San Diego County would be a phenomenal thing for everyone, mm -hmm. everyone. Yeah, and you, you talk about yeah. soccer as, as maybe the seed and the kernel, but the business that kind of has to fill, fill in around it. And when you spoke about how the idea first originated, okay, let's be a team, let's have Pacific Asset, but then start layering in, okay, you probably need maybe retail, maybe we need condos, maybe we need a river park. Can you talk me through, I guess, within the team behind closed doors and these secret backdoor meetings that I've heard so much about? Right. You they know, were all in the mayor's public calendar, for what it's worth? That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a yeah. Yeah. That's not important. Yeah. Okay. Um, but talk me through how you went from soccer itself to soccer city. Right? How did you factor in all these different layers that, in theory, would appeal to a very broad sort of spectrum of our society? Yeah. So. So we, we started with the idea of we need to build a stadium that is successful for soccer. And if you look across the nation at like the best stadium experiences, they all have not just a good stadium, but a lot of entertainment around the stadium that makes the game longer than two hours. I mean, let's face it, four or five miles down the road is the beach. And like the beach is pretty compelling in, you know, June, July, and August. Well, July and August. September and October. Yeah. So, so we need to do something to make soccer work in this town that actually not only brings the sport and there's a diehard community and I think that would be fine but actually to expand the footprint that makes it something you can do before the game or after the game and a more of a day-long experience rather than here's two hours and then get back in a car and drive home mm -hmm. and the league actually fully supports that idea so like one of their big premises was hey don't come and build a stadium in the middle of a big parking lot and say, we're good because that's not really today's environment. So we started with, we need to build a great daytime game experience. That meant stadium, that meant entertainment outside of the stadium that you could come into. So the really first link was, let's build a stadium and have people come out and enjoy music. Okay, well now if we're gonna do that, now, now what do we need? And it's like amazing how quickly you go from, we built a stadium, we built a stadium in a music venue, we built a stadium in a music venue to people need to have a place to get a beer, this, um, to sit around and talk, somewhere to go after. Okay, well that's great, but now I need a place for that to work for the other 330 days of the year where you don't have a soccer game in the stadium, so how do you do that? You can't have that sitting on a parking lot, so now you need housing and you need an office, and very quickly it built. Did we think we were launching all of that when we first started this? No, but, but the reality of where we have landed is that we need to do those things to make the base work, which is make a great game time experience, 
and make something that's valuable to the community 365 days a year to bring people in. Um, and what we realized pretty quickly is that in San Diego, nothing happens fast, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> so we had a very real stop function with Major League Soccer who said, look, we got 12 cities and we have four teams. And you know we love San Diego and we love the fact that you have Landon and Shannon and Juan Carlos, um, Juan Carlos Rodriguez, who most of you probably know, but runs Univision Sports and Televisa Sports in Mexico. The super powerful, the most powerful media guy in soccer in America. We love that, but you need a stadium and we're not waiting 10 years for you to show up with a stadium plan. So the initiative approach started by us saying, listen, we got to do it in a way that works to bring Major League Soccer. And, um, and once you're in the initiative, now you've got to do something that actually makes people value what you're proposing. So we said, we'll fund the entire community park that the city should otherwise be funding. That, you know, at the end of the day, they don't have the money for Everybody knows they don't have the money for it. There's been 30 acres of park that's supposed to be built on that parking lot for 20 something years and it's never happened. So we'll just pick that up and we'll say, here's an additional contribution over and above paying for the land and building all the rest of it. And the hope was, hey, that's way better than everything we've ever seen in Mission Valley ever before. Should be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but Sandy Grass is thing, slowing things down. So here we are. Nick, do you remember the first time, uh, Nick McKay? Okay. Yeah. The first time that you heard about uh, a new stadium for the Chargers? <laughs> oh, let's see. I guess it was after. When you were four? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the 90s. Yeah. Let's go back to the 90s. Uh, yeah, well, after the 98 Super Bowl, it started to. Started to ramp the conversation up picked up. Yeah, and it never stopped until they left. Hmm. So. so it took them 20 years to figure out that actually we're not going to do anything. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, pretty much. But uh, what they sold us on in '98 was that they they had increased their payroll to, to make it to the World Series, yeah. and they basically told the public, "Do you want more of this? Yeah. We'll vote on building Petco." And then after that, they've had a lot of different ownership changes, and they just haven't really put yeah. the money into it. And the I think that's. Hasn't been there. It, it, when you compound that with the Spanos family's um, yeah, yeah farewell tour, that people are don't trust people. I think voters are real. They don't they don't trust anybody who's coming in here and trying to build something. You know, I, yeah. they don't yeah. trust yeah. anyone. Period. Yeah, they don't I trust mean, the mayor. I, I think they the don't presidential trust election that, a couple of years ago showed. Yeah. yeah, that says a lot about like what I just said, which is like I didn't even know who to trust to get information from. And that includes the media. Which is a really interesting. Oh, that included yeah. the media. Yeah, that's why this is so valuable, actually, for what it's worth. DK, like, I, I think we're transitioning from a period in which you trust people to tell you what to think, into into an environment where people want to see and evaluate for themselves what to mm -hmm. think, but to do it in a very condensed fashion because we all look at Facebook videos for three but not six seconds, mm -hmm. and that's a really hard matrix. But it's what makes this format valuable because if you want to go learn more, go deeper, you have the ability to go do it. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of what, what we're trying to do. What I think we have to urge people to do is actually go see things for themselves. Yeah. You know, see, I think the Potteries are a great example. I mean, you, all the points to raise are fair. Go to a Pottery game on a Saturday night. Go down to Petco, get there. Yeah. The games start at like 5.40. So get down there at 4 o'clock. And, and see that scene, feel that scene. Tell me, and, and watch the game, and then go out afterwards, and then come home and say that wasn't valuable, mm -hmm. that wasn't fun, that wasn't a community building experience, that wasn't good for San Diego's businesses, They're the taxi drivers, the restaurateurs, the hotels, the bars. Your point about the enthusiasm, that's mostly, I think, the connection with your fellow fan. And if you go to some of the great games in the best MLS stadiums here, like Portland, Portland is an off-the-hook stadium. It's not huge, but people walk out of a Timbers game, A, it sells out every game, and it sells out every game because it's a great experience while you're in there, right? And there is a supporter community, which for those who don't follow soccer is like a really random thing. What is a supporters club, right? Um, but, but there's a group of people who like so thoroughly believe in the team and the sport that they come out and they build these amazing TIFOs and they have rituals and cheers and chants and there's a culture around that that I don't think the average, I grew up 75 years ago with football experience understands and that's part of what we're struggling with in Soccer City is that culture is shifting, right? And that intimate experience, the condensed um, shared passion 
the fans who are willing to go above and beyond hasn't really existed in traditional American culture um, for the last 30 years. There's no NFL team that produces that. I don't know. I'm a uh, Packer uh, fan. Come, come up to Lambeau Field. <laughs> okay, that's actually fair. That's probably one of the best yeah. ex experiences. I mean, like, I grew up in Dallas, yeah. and, you know, the Cowboys fans are damn passionate fans. Yeah. Um, but there's no TIFO yeah. at a Cowboys game. Yeah. 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 What was the, what were the Timbers? Like, how did the Timbers get their stadium? Do we know? We, I don't know the story. But. Yeah, so they, they converted what was an old minor league baseball stadium okay. into a soccer stadium in downtown Portland. And that's, like, location matters, mm -hmm. right? And the surrounding matters. And so there's this, this really awesome kind of vibrant activity set just around the stadium that makes the in, the in stadium experience even better because it's compounded with people coming in and they're already enthusiastic before they show up because you've sort of soaked in the passion before you got there and then post a couple beers you've soaked in the passion after you've left and so it's a fun after the game too yeah. sports is about the destination yeah. many times i mean when i i mean i'm you know 47 years old now and, and you know I, I i care if my team wins or loses but ultimately i have a little perspective i don't cry anymore like i did when i was 11. Yeah. but you know when you go to a game it's because you're with friends and you yeah. just want to spend time with them or you're with your father and your mother who are you know in their 70s and you don't know how many more of these you're going to get with them or it's with uh you know three or four business colleagues you want to get to know better it's all about the experience and the more interesting the place you go the longer you're able to be there the more you're able to meet other people who share your interests have some of the local tastes and smells of, of the community it's, there's nothing like it there's nothing like it to get out and actually put that in your pocket and touch and feel real life people and taste real live food and see a real live game up close, whatever it is, soccer, baseball, or otherwise, there's something like it. I think the soccer, like building a, like a village around the stadium, I think that's gonna real, it will work really well for soccer because soccer is such a defined time limit. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, baseball, you could be there for four hours. True. Yeah. You never know they, signing yeah, up I think that, I think that would really work for a lot of families around. I mean, there's, you look at the Qualcomm site, I mean, it's suburbs pretty much all around and then I like, I think that's really going to translate for families. You know? I think it'll be great. I mean, I tried to take my daughter, I did take her to uh, a concert at uh, Qualcomm not that long ago. U2 was in town. Yeah. She'd never been to a big time stadium concert. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we wanted to do nothing more than kind of enjoy the ambiance before the game. And it was hard to do there. Where do you do that? We had to park far away at a mall. And we had a meal in a strip mall. And then we had to walk and navigate all this traffic just to get to the parking lot and then get through the parking lot and then get in the stadium and it was just very disjointed. So the, the concept of having everything right there where you can walk right from the pub into the stadium, not have to dodge, you know, seven lanes of traffic, that's a mm -hmm. lot of appeal. Well, Interesting look. question. Does your daughter play soccer? Uh, actually, no. She doesn't. I tried. I did everything I could <laughs> to get her to play. I coached her at age, I think, four, five, and six and she just wanted nothing to do with it. Well, I feel like soccer is one of the sports that women are more likely to play. I agree. That parents Agreed. expect that their daughters are more capable of playing, and so that they get involved in soccer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I feel like soccer could be, it's one of the sports where women will go to it, mm -hmm. you know, and women will support it more so than any other sport because they themselves played it. Yeah. And then on top of that, I feel like when it comes to you guys talking about community, women will go to something if their friends are going to it. Yep. And if their friends love it, if their friends are passionate about it, they too will become passionate about it. Um, Points. Um, although your daughter doesn't play soccer, I know she is big into theater, right? Yes. I think that is one of the things that is actually probably offered within the soccer scene proposal as far as like other, you know, entertainment type values that doesn't get talked about very often. No, we, yeah. we don't do a good job of talking about the concert venue that we're creating. We don't do a good job of talking about the other entertainment options that will be there. We're incredibly light. The um, venue that handles the average superstar band, mm -hmm. not the mega star sure. band, like, like the amphitheater. Yeah, kind of stuff. yeah. which is um, most bands. Which is these days. They're just very about everything other than the Rolling Stones and YouTube. Yeah, they're all going to cheer this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But finding the right venue that you can bring people in that's like digitally enabled that can handle the existing concert needs, etc. That's not a four-hour drive from people in the north. Part of San Diego down to the venue. There's value in that. 
So we'll, we'll do that. Well, that's a huge point. I mean, I'm a North County resident, and going downtown is not easy, particularly yeah. uh, on weeknights. Can't you got to deal it. with traffic. Yeah. I literally can't stand it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I well, I can't stand parking. Yeah. <laughs> but North County to to Qualcomm is half a the time a little more manageable. Yeah. It's a manageable trip, and if there's something there for the whole family to do. Not just stand in the parking lot before a game, but to see a band or have a really good meal or just walk in a nice park along a river, which I know is another piece of it. One thing that I think is actually really interesting, and you talk about things that you don't do very well when it comes to promoting what it is that you're doing, but even this whole conversation. That list is long, sadly. Uh, it's cool. We'll, 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 start we'll get there. One, one conversation at a time. With uh, the transit line and the trolley line that's yeah. there. And, and I think that San Diego itself as a city has major, major transportational infrastructure issues. Yeah. But when it comes to moving forward, I think that the city has a 2035 climate action campaign goal of cutting our emissions in half that right now we are nowhere near. Yeah. Um, I think I saw a study on Voice of San Diego, I believe, that even were we to build everything that is sort of like outlined, all the major high density uh, housing on transit lines, we're still nowhere near where we need to be. So one, I'm shocked that the pushback is what it is, even though we voted for this climate action thing. But two, at least I like to see some sort of progression towards that. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder when it comes to transit itself, you know, how do we all feel? Like you said, you hate traffic. That's you know, Did you take the trolley? The trolley took you where you needed to be? I would. I was just on the phone with my mom today saying how I. I am dealing with the worst traffic I've ever dealt with on my way home today. And um, yeah, it almost made me late for that. <laughs> Technically, you were, but it's okay. Yeah, Technically, yeah a lot, a lot oh, of, great. Yeah, a lot of productivity is lost in, in traffic. It's, it's ridiculous. So anything we can do to mitigate people sitting in traffic a huge on the deal. five uh, or wherever it might be is a, it's a big yeah. deal. This is also one of those age divide questions. like. If we're kind of doing the right thing that we're supposed to do as a city, we should be thinking about people who are 14 and 15 and 16 today because by the time this is built, they're going to be 32 and 33 and having families. They're the, they're the group that say, actually, I want the transit thing because I can get from there to downtown to the gas lamp to Petco. I can go to the airport. Is it perfectly efficient? No. Is it a lot more efficient than getting in a car and driving and parking and moving and schlepping my luggage? Yeah, it's way more efficient than that. And like, we're trying to take care of that, right? This is what is so amazing. And, but, but again, the university's near-term problem is I don't, I don't need to land for a long time. I just need the stadium, yeah. and and they have a stadium solution for a while because it'll stay on the city's books. Yeah. And then at some point down the road, they'll have enough money from the other development to try and build a stadium. And we've kind of been through this before. That measure C was, let's have taxpayers fund the stadium, right? Yeah. And you you know better than most how that went. I've talked to my mom about this, who has a pretty surf surface level understanding of San Diego sports. And you say like, well, there's two plans. One of them's uh, private investors and they're called Soccer City. And then it's them versus San Diego State. And her initial, her initial response is, well, just go with the school, education first. And right. the more you look at it though, it, these are private developers too. And they're not, that, isn't that what the lawsuit's about? That's the lawsuit. that, that they're not being, up front with the public and the voter and the people signing signatures, you know? What is the timetable for that to, that lawsuit to play out? So, um, look, look, that's a hard thing to answer because yeah. it's courts. It's fast though, but remember this is courts. So fast is relative to a very slow baseline um, before July, basically, mm -hmm. uh, when we have to publish a ballot. I mean, I think you're, what, what this lawsuit basically says is, hey, two private development efforts, be two private development efforts. Call yourself, mm -hmm. you know, private, private, private campus X, yeah. right? Or campus West or whatever. But you, you can't use the term San Diego State University. You can use it to describe your, um, your, what you're proposing. You can use it to describe your benefits. You can't brand with it. You can't take the state's asset, which is the name of that university and say, mm -hmm. This is a development effort for the university. I mean, there's a law around that that's like incredibly clear that says you cannot designate without the permission of trustees a political activity like an initiative or a political organization like a campaign committee with the term San Diego State or SDSU. And the political activity, the initiative is called SDSU West and the campaign committee is called the Friends of SDSU. 
and they're confusing your mom. And yeah, honestly, they're confusing the UT and NBC and KUSI and like all the people who are supposed to know. They're not confusing the Chronicle. No, no, no. Not 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 um, and that's the point. The point is like, let's have a fair discussion. Let's have a legal discussion. Um, and then and then let the people decide. Don't don't hide behind a brand that's not yours. And if you're not willing to recirculate, because there's plenty of time to go recirculate. Mm. If you're not willing to recirculate, it says, hey, absent the brand SDC, we don't think we can win, which is precisely what the law is designed to protect against. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't get to use the state's asset of the name of this university to sell us an inferior product to people because they say, do whatever is in the best interest of the university. Mm -hmm. Jason, you're, you're a lawyer. Or at least you I did. Started. I am, I practiced for 10 years. There you go. And in reviewing this lawsuit, or even in just hearing sort of the terms of what's right and what's wrong and what's allowed and what's not, I mean, where would you, where would you fall? I can't comment on the merits of it. I haven't reviewed the, you know, the, the filings and uh, the law in question. I mean, at the end of the day, it just seems silly to me. For people to be, you know, to fighting, fighting over this opportunity for everyone, it just, I don't know, it doesn't feel right. I'm hoping the judge will do what a lot of judges do, which is say, you know what, I, you have some good arguments, you have some good arguments, but will you sit in the room with that mediator? Can we not, can you guys work something out here? Can we just have one plan? Yeah. Please, guys, get yeah. in the room. So my dad was a judge for 25 years and ultimately his goal is to get the coconuts in the same room and crack them together and say, fix this, stop. You know, there's a reason that, you know, 90 some odd percent of lawsuits never go to trial. It's because yeah. they resolve themselves. So, you know, hopefully, not to undermine what you're doing, I would love it for the, both groups to just say, you know what, let's just come together. Let's yeah. just figure out something that works for everyone here. You know, we would too. And here's the amazing thing. We think we gave the ask. So, you know, in most in most negotiations, you have an ask and you have somebody who says, I can't meet that. And you kind of come to something in the middle. Yeah. And San Diego State came out and said, we need 35 acres. We were like, yikes, that's really hard. <laughs> but, um, okay, yeah. here's 35 acres. And, and they got told, you're gonna get your ask, and they back. And the next day, they said they published. We're backing away from the table. Run, run that back. You gave them their ask, and then they were told by who? The mayor. The mayor. That they were getting their ask. Okay. Twenty-four hours later, they backed away from the table. So, no. uh, like you also understand negotiations, right? So and so says, I need X, and like that's normally over your, the top. You, you go to buy or sell your house. You're going to take one side or other of what you think market is, right? Yeah. They staked the claim that they thought was going to be bigger than we could give. Yeah. And credit where it's due to Steve Altman and Peter Seidler and the guys that continue to give real money to this university. Everybody looked at that and was like, oh my gosh, that's a huge ask. But, okay, we'll do that and thought they had given the ask. And, and if you've seen the discussion since, it's not, here's what we need, right? With any kind of real specificity. In fact, they keep saying, we don't need the land for up to 80 years. So it's basically, these other developers want it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, Sad. I, I mean, look, it's I get that, old. but like then own that, right? But let's imagine Ford, I mean, go back to the powder thing. There was yeah. all kinds of lawsuits and controversy prior to the stadium, Pepco being built, right? Yeah, it, it wasn't was a slam dunk. Acrimonious yeah. mess, right? Yeah. But 10, you know, 15, whatever we are, 17 years later, does anyone even think about that stuff? Or does everyone just go, you know, it's great that we have a stadium, that the Padres are here, and then, yeah, they kind of stink this year, but boy, it's nice having that stadium. Trust the process. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. We, I think like nerds like me who have yeah. a podcast, we, we look at like the on the field product yeah. and get upset about it, but I, it's hard to argue now that it it's a good, it's been a, win overall yeah i think i think some of the development they thought they could sell more condos around it faster yeah. but i priced them lower and we'll talk yeah <laughs> first so can i jump as a recent stsu grad yeah. what's like the biggest sort of most difficult question that you ponder with that we haven't done a good job of answering for you you know i think i just want a better understanding of what the stsu west initiative would do for bonding or bringing people together um, outside of housing, there's plenty of housing. But as far as creating some type of culture for people to follow and connect on, uh, that's something I still haven't really understood how they're doing. Um, maybe you could provide me some insight. 
insight as to how you think that that might happen. Well, maybe on the next episode. Maybe on the next episode. People, you know, I, I, invited, love that. I invited as many Aztecs as I could find in my Rolodex to this thing tonight. Sadly, for one reason or another. Well, we, yeah, we've tried to no, get people on our show. Yeah. Like, they, they, only they, exist on the they only exist on the internet. I don't know, yeah. If, yeah, if the media company was here, maybe they'd... I mean, you've been to football games, right? San yeah, State. I've been to. And what's your San view of the State. atmosphere there and the, and the, the scene and, and, and how is that? I love it. How is it. The, the status quo serving San Diego State? Well, first of all, I was I was a freshman. I went in to the, the game and, of course, it was like... Even though they lost, for me, it was a, a great event to go to just because I was at a, a, a sports event. Mm -hmm. And I wanted more of that. Like, even outside of Sanders State, I've always wanted more of that. So it, I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't a huge turnout. I think that maybe with soccer, you can get a bigger turnout. Well, you look at SDSU basketball, and it really works because it's such, it's the right amount of seats. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And this state, I mean, I love Qualcomm. I grew up at Qualcomm. Yeah. It is a cathedral to me, but it's ridiculous to go see a, a San Diego State football game there. There's 25,000. Unless there's like, football. yeah, unless they're like having one of their great yeah. years. That's what struck me when I went. It's the best game. Because I've been to some San Diego State games, and I didn't go to the university or anything, but I'm just a sports fan. I want to check it out. Right. It was hard to get excited in that big cavernous stadium. Yeah. The fans that were there were really passionate. They just weren't enough to fill it. There weren't enough to fill it. Yeah. That's, that's and, that's, and you take a lot of like subconscious cues for how many seats are open in this stadium. I mean, that's part of why actually we designed the stadium that, that has, we, we have like a bunch of seats at the top that retract. So think your university high school or your, your high school gymnasium rather, um, that you, you can pull out the benches but like with real seats and they're just like way more expensive than a bench. But you can have a stadium that's dynamic from 18,000 to 33,500. And so it can feel full all times. And there's just a ton of like in sort of subconscious value associated with, do we have a full house? Does it feel sold out? I mean, there's some crazy features in the comparison between the two. Like we have 800 student housing using units SDSU West, the plan for quote the university has 260. Like, that's their own traffic report. 800, they have 260. 800 versus 260. Student housing units. Yeah. And a university expansion campus. Correct. So, we're th we have three times the the volume of student housing units at Soccer City that they do in the SDSU West quote unquote initiative. Okay. Stuff like that doesn't make a lot of sense, but for your your recent grad. What they don't have any of is an entertainment area. There's no sports culture around it. There's like a little bit of retail. It's like a laundromat and a grocery store and a CVS. And they'll bring food trucks in for the game. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, actually a huge distinction for the average San Diegan. The, the grad who went through San Diego State was like, I love the culture and now I'm leaving and so I can't live in the 260 um, student housing that's there. So now what do I do? Like that site's not that valuable other than six days a year, unless you've got something there for the average person, 365. Mm. And like the typical yep. San Diegan isn't gonna live there in SDSU West. They're not gonna work at SDSU West. They're gonna go on a Friday night for a soccer game, on a Saturday afternoon for a football game, on a Wednesday because they wanna hear a great band come through that hosts 5,000, not 25 or 50,000, or a good meal. Right. Yeah. That's the maybe even someday walk in our park. But SDSC right. West is framing it like they're going to build more research buildings and it's going to be education based. And yeah. Do we yeah. believe that? I don't know. Do I know? I think yeah. the question you're asking is yeah. how big does a university have to be? And yeah. Is it, well, like, I mean, how um, big can it be? It's one of the biggest they just campuses. They built some research based buildings. So, yeah. and those, I mean, they're amazing. But how much do you actually want your kids to be, like how big is a classroom supposed to be before your kids should be studying online? And that's not even counting into effect the, the whole idea of the California State University system being primarily focused on teaching as opposed to research like the UC system. You know, like as a state institution, you've got your UCs and your Cal States, and they've both got very different paths. Right. Tracks. I'm like, let's not even get into the idea of San Diego State sort of trying to veer into that other Lane because you know, unfortunately, at some point, we gotta wrap up tonight. 
but, but, that's on but you're tapping yeah, so in, you're tapping into your next show, which is the university industrial complex that's emerged in the last twenty years. Yeah. Which is every university needs to build, 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 I can't. That's so scary. they can get more kids to come and get them to pay more tuition. It's just this arms race between university A, B, and C to who's going to have the shiniest new dorm and the shiniest new lab and the shiniest new stadium. So a question for the four of you all: How many of you know of the next expansion? other than Qualcomm for the university? Um, I don't. I don't. I have no, no clue. So this is what's so crazy. So the university owns a ton of land on campus that they haven't used yet. In fact, they've, for the last 13 years, they've been going through a process to handle, they have 30-ish thousand students, 33,000 students or so today, to handle the growth from 33 to 44,000 students. And it's all right on campus, right? And 600,000 square feet of research is right on campus. And since 2005, they've been debating that how do we expand on campus? And in 2005, it was like urgently critical. We need it to happen today. And here we are 13 years later, and we're still going through the SQL process for an EIR to get that expansion to happen. And like, nobody knows that, right? <laughs> so this debate, you know, you, you asked me at the beginning, what's really going on here? The university is, is telling the truth. They don't need the land for a long time because the next 11,000 students, the next 30% growth in total capacity, which comes with challenges, is already accommodated for on campus, right? Or right next door to campus. And, and you probably know this better than I do, but the trend overwhelmingly in people who are 19 to 24 is let me take my classes online. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't need to come for all of my classes locally. Yeah. Or online another is, trend is you know, maybe I can just go straight into my job. Instead of, like my older sister, getting into debt, even though she didn't even go to the career path she studied for, which is happening in every yes. family. Yes. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people who I went to school with, myself included, who have found a career or a path outside of what we, you know, technically study. Mm -hmm. On the front end of this program, we kind of said, you know, what are our different perspectives going into this? Mm -hmm. I think you were sort of curious. I think you were very much undecided. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're very much in favor, and I think you were in favor as well. And after having this sort of hour-long conversation, I kind of just want to go in a circle and say, you know, how do we feel, you know, after having this discussion? Well, I want to correct. The, I mean, I'm not in favor necessarily of any plan. I'm just what I'm not in favor of is just sitting and letting that public asset be underused, like it mm -hmm. currently is. The status quo is ridiculous. The stadium that used to host an animal team that's gone. The stadium that sits empty most days. They have a lot of good ideas there. For, the, for all of them to be thrown away because of this kind of Me Too movement that came through, with this other people saying, wait a second, all that land, maybe we want it. Yeah. There's got to be a better way. For us to fight for the next five years over this plot of land is ridiculous. That land needs to be developed ASAP. Mm -hmm. The benefits are, are here. The downsides, I, I don't see them. I just don't see them. Nick? Um, I, I guess my feeling on it is that, you know, whenever we post a podcast or, or write about this subject, we're always using the Soccer City side and they're always upfront about like the information, you know, what the plan is. And whenever we talk about SDSU West or just SDSU, all these people come out and say horrible things to us. And there's, there's this huge just negativity coming from that side. And, it's like a black and red wave. Yeah, well, d like during the... the when the debate was centered around the special election, there was it just felt like that side was just sniping from I guess the, the Mesa. But they were you know, they 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 didn't have a plan themselves and Soccer City did and I, I always thought that was interesting and I still feel like the Soccer City side is more upfront and willing to discuss it mm -hmm. than the other side. And I, I went to San Diego State for three years and you know, the way that side, the San Diego State West talks about it, they make it sound like every alumni is for that plan, and that's just not the case. I mean, there's there's so many people have gone there, and they're all over town. They're on the city council. They're the mayor. You know, like it's a big group of people, and I don't. I, I get weary when one initiative is trying to say that we speak for that whole group. And I don't. I just don't agree with that. I, I don't think it's dangerous. Nice. Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, I'm an Aztec all the way. <laughs> um, I'm here today. I see that Soccer City is present, and 
I understand how they are trying to pull the community together. So I'm going to say that I'm in favor of Soccer City. And if, if SDSU West, West Initiative were to, you know, come together on, on this kind of conversation, um, one that's a little more intimate, like maybe I can hear how they actually think that they want to bring people together. Um, yeah, that's, that's just where I currently stand. Nick, we know where you stand. <laughs> Yeah, but I'll tell you, for what it's worth, y'all, I mean, I, I really appreciate the openness because I think it's, we have tried from the beginning to be able to come up, up with an idea, which I'll fully admit is not perfect. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect idea for all parties, right? But understanding where different people are coming from and being able to then appropriately help them understand where we think we are delivering, that's really valuable. And, and yeah. there's a cohort of people who will say, I don't care, I don't like you, and it's okay, this is an election, right? We might lose, and you know, to your point, DK, I think there's actually three choices here. There's yeah. STSUS, Soccer City, or neither. And your point is right. Neither is unbelievably expensive. Unbelievably expensive. Yeah. And it squanders on either side a real opportunity to do something with like an environmental blight, uh, the largest parking lot west of the Mississippi, all the things we've talked about we shouldn't have today, doing nothing is really expensive. And yeah, very clearly, for one reason or another, there seems to be similar trends and themes in either party. You know, those of us who think with our minds and wonder and ask questions and seek truth, you know, we come to a table up here at Bay City, our fantastic host tonight. Thank you, Bay City. Yeah, with the grace and beauty. Cheers. cheers. So as we as we wrap up, I'll say cheers. Thank you to Bay City. Thank, Thank you to all of you. Thank you. DK. This is the first edition of Crafting Community, the conversation, and I assure you there will be several more to come in the weeks, months, and years to follow. So thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks, DK. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks, everyone.